Good morning from Ford City, Pennsylvania on Monday, November the 8th, 2021. This is Chuck King bringing you a morning Bible study. We are studying the preaching methods and messages of the apostolic teams that went out in the first century church. And we're going to look at Acts 19 today. We're trying to determine whether our our methods and message can compare with the first century. And if not, we should adapt and begin preaching like they preached. So Acts 19, 1, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. So in Ephesus, there were already some disciples he found out about, and verse 2, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So there's a, a tremendous immaturity level of these, these disciples. They're not really taught well concerning the uh, doctrines of Christ. And uh, But the first question Paul asked them, was if they received the Holy Spirit when they believed. See, he didn't say, did you set apart money for a building? Or did you start a Sunday school? Or did you start a Bible college? He didn't ask any of those questions, but he wanted to know whether they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit when they believed. Now, of course, you can see from that question that Paul knew that people could believe, they could repent, they could trust in Jesus, but not be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And we've got to adjust our teaching and our doctrine to understand that when you first get saved, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, you needed the Holy Spirit to, to draw you with conviction to repentance. You needed the Holy Spirit to open your eyes, to show you your need of Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, but you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit when you first believe. And they said to him, No, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. So we've got a group of disciples who are really disciples of John the Baptist. They understood their need for repentance and water baptism as John taught. And they were baptized. They had been baptized in water. They believed in Jesus, but they weren't taught correctly. And Paul said in verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So Paul made, made it very clear to them that John was the forerunner pointing only to Jesus and salvation through Jesus Christ. The faith they had was to be manifested in Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So he started basically from scratch with these disciples who who were believers, but they were very immature, baby, baby Christians who didn't even understand the Christian baptism in water, let alone baptism in the Holy Spirit. So what did Paul do as, as a teacher, as a, a prophet, as an apostle? He led them through the truth of, of the revelation of the Lord which be begins with repentance, turning your, your mind to believe the Lord, your thoughts to believe the Lord, your thinking, and your behavior to follow in obedience. But then the, the need for water baptism to have that cleansing of your conscience, to die to yourself and to be raised by the power of God, that's essential as well as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is what 
Peter taught that great crowd on the day of Pentecost. First, repent. Second, be baptized in water. And three, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when the New Testament, uh, when Jesus talked about baptize them, when the, the disciples talked about baptizing them, they didn't just stop at water baptism, but they, they included baptism in the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So it's a small group of 12 disciples here that were very mature, probably had been taught by Apollos, and he had not received the correct teaching until later, as we studied from from uh, the ministry couple that taught them taught him more correctly and and so we know that now these disciples needed proper teaching and that's what Paul put in order you see the apostle puts the church in order and they couldn't move on until they had the foundational essentials in their lives which was repentance water baptism and baptism in the Holy Spirit when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and filled them. And they also, like on the day of Pentecost, like in Cornelius' household, they began speaking with tongues and prophesying, preaching, declaring the word of God as inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so these 12 men were greatly blessed that day by the ministry of Paul's apostolic team. Verse 8, And he entered the synagogue, meaning Paul, and continued speaking out boldly for three months. Now, this is in Ephesus. This is where we are. We're here in Ephesus. And so he went again. His, his custom was to go to the synagogue to try to reach the Old Covenant believing Jews and God fearing Gentiles with the good news of the gospel. For three months he reasoned with them and persuaded them. You see, reasoning and persuading them. That's how our ministry should look. It should look like we're really making an effort to convince people to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And he reasoned and persuaded with them about the kingdom of God. Verse 9, But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years, so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So Ephesus was in in Asia at that time. Asia was uh, more like Turkey, the whole big area where modern day Turkey is. It, Asia wasn't way over in the east uh, like we understand it to be now. But it, it's in that area where Paul ministered around Ephesus, which was in, in uh, modern day Turkey. And for two years, Paul was able to reason daily in what's called the school of Tyrannus, some sort of a a place where they, they had a, a, a primitive, I would suggest primitive, not organized like we have our universities, but a school where he would teach every day with the, with the disciples and people would come and go. And the, I'm sure that the disciples would go out and preach from there. So for two years, because of that ministry, outside the synagogue, I might add, but and in this school of Tyrannus, they reached all of Asia with the word of God. But notice here in verse 9 that some are always hardened and disobedient and speak evil of the gospel. So what do you do? He didn't stay. He didn't stay in the synagogue because of that. 
when you are opposed by people, you don't stay and argue with them. You do what Jesus taught you to do. You shake off the dust and you go find people who will receive you. People of peace, people who are worthy, people who who believe the gospel and and support your ministry. And that's what Paul did. He obeyed the training that Jesus gave his disciples. It didn't stay and argue with these unbelievers. And that's what we should do. Not stay and fight with people, but look for people who will believe and become disciples who will follow Jesus and reproduce the fruit of the kingdom. Verse 11, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. This is an amazing gifting that God, by the Holy Spirit, anointed Paul with, called here extraordinary miracles that God would do through Paul. Even uh, parts of his, his, his handkerchiefs and his his work aprons, you would say, were taken from him and carried to the sick. And those people would be delivered and healed. Evil spirits would go out, sicknesses would be healed. Uh, and so we see this gifting that the apostle had. And Paul refers to this later on, that the, the signs of a true apostle were done among you. And uh, these are these miraculous things, like we saw in the ministry of Peter and John and of the other apostles. God gave them a special anointing. And we would be foolish to say that they didn't have this special gifting as compared to us. I'm sure that this power began to manifest in their life by uh, the revelation of the Lord. By grace, they saw that they were able to do these things in Jesus' name. We can't claim these things for ourselves unless God begins to work in us. Certainly we should desire the greater gifts of the Spirit, that God would anoint us with those giftings. I remember back in my early ministry, I used to, I used to uh, keep a diary, and I, I remember how... The Lord would speak to me, and I would I would write down those impressions. And one of the things that I still remember, even though I've lost that that book that I wrote in over the years, one of the things that the Lord spoke to me was that that I would be doing the work of an apostle. He didn't say I would be an apostle, but he said I would do the work of an apostle. And the reason I make that distinction is that I haven't seen these extraordinary miracles at work through my through my ministry. We've had answers to prayer, yes, but by and large, we are the body of Christ praying for one another, and God hears and answers our prayers. But these extraordinary miracles that the Bible talks about, like Jesus did, like these first apostles did, I don't see them functioning in our churches today. Now that doesn't mean that God has ceased from manifesting his gifts this way. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't support that. But it's it's that other there are other reasons for this. Perhaps I believe the uh, one of the greatest ones is is unbelief in the body of Christ. Jesus said when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's an open question. He had to rebuke those early disciples for their unbelief. And unbelief is quite a problem in the body of Christ today. Remember, remember, because of unbelief and doubt, Jesus could not or would not do many miracles, even in his hometown. And so we know that unbelief quenches the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is read the number of times that Jesus rebuked his disciples for not believing. We know James tells us that if you have doubt mixed in with your faith, you become unstable like 
someone on the ways of the sea, double-minded, and you won't receive anything from the Lord. So I think that's one of the big problems in the body of Christ concerning these supernatural works of God, unbelief. Yet God is the one who must call and gift his people. And it's not something we can go to school for or learn about or uh, manifest for ourselves. But we see this power working in Paul's life and ministry over sickness and disease and demons, just like the ministry of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this, and the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So here we have an example of people who are not called and gifted by God to do these extraordinary miracles like the apostolic team. But they tried to use religion and a formula to cast out demons out of people. And the demon attacked all seven of them. And uh, the scripture says uh, the demon spoke to them and, and recognized Jesus and Paul, but didn't recognize them. And this one man beat up all seven of them, overpowered them. They fled out of the house naked and wounded after that beating. This shows you why we should not attempt, without the anointing of God, to, to uh, get involved in spiritual warfare. You know, this presumption, like the seven sons of Sceva, that you can just cast out demons by using a formula, the name of Jesus, is foolishness. You have to be, you have to be anointed and called and gifted of God, being led by the Spirit, to do this. Otherwise, you have these kinds of disastrous results. And I wonder how many presumptuous Christians have been damaged by the forces of evil by trying to do spiritual warfare without the anointing of God. I think we'll stop right there. We've gone long enough. This is a powerful message here. Acts 19 with the apostolic team of Paul at Ephesus dealing with that small group of 12 disciples of John the Baptist, getting them uh, corrected and on the right track doctrinally and experientially in the power of the Spirit, and then uh, continuing to teach and preach that unbelievers were, were mocking him, but he turned away to the disciples and in two years, because of his teaching, those disciples reached all of Asia. And uh, these miracles that we've talked at length about here, they must have been something to see. And even the imposters, when they tried to imitate, found out that spiritual warfare is not for the novice, but you had better be called and gifted of God, truly walking in the spirit to do the will of the fathers the father in spiritual warfare so good lesson today from acts 19 let's embrace the teaching we receive from the word of god and apply it to our lives we'll talk to you tomorrow god bless